Jumbo, Jumbo Mama. This is Mama Sarah's story time. Welcome. I've come this evening to present to you my first book and my YouTube channel. The channel is called Mama Sarah's Story Time. And the name of tonight's presentation and my first book is Jumbo Mama. It's a book I wrote and published this year. It's called Jabu Mama, A Hostess in Africa. It's a story of my time growing up in Kenya. So I started thinking first about the why in my decision to start a YouTube channel. And um, simply put, I owe it to my parents, to the great state of Wisconsin, and to public broadcasting all around the world. I did it because now we can, all of us can, if my parents had had this venue, they'd have been all over it. And you know what? I bet they're both a little bit jealous right now, but that's okay. I didn't have the typical Midwest child's youth. Um, even my own neighborhood was not that typical. It was a cooperative neighborhood it was built in the early 50s. And uh, lots of university and professional folks lived there. The reason that I feel my story is relevant today, though, it is for what I learned as a middle schooler. You know, as a child growing up, especially in this day and age, you may find yourself making choices that give you cause for pause. And this is my, my invitation to you to go ahead and pause. Take that moment to choose what you do. I know that not every decision you make in your life is going to feel like the most popular or feel the greatest to you, but it will all be okay eventually. If you take away one thing from my stories or my channel, I hope it is this. Your life is what you make it. So, in honor of Storytime Man, Music Lady, Wisconsin School of the Air, uh, The Friendly Giant, Fred Rogers, Mr. Science, and every pioneer of educational broadcasting, I humbly present Mama Sarah's story time. Why Kenya, you say? Well, it's because my parents made the unconventional decision to educate their children in the way they thought best. And I'd just like to go out on record at the very beginning as saying I'm so glad they did. And the other part of the why is because Kenya. How do you have an experience like that and not share it with today's world? So this is a very small book about growing up in a very big way. It was in uh, 1967, a long time ago. My brother Adam and I were whisked off to attend school in Nairobi, Kenya. We had adventures with scientists, explorers, lion whisperers, world leaders, and even a flotus. Take a book safari with me today. Learn a little Swahili along the way. I'll try to help. And step up with me to a braver you. Okay, let's get started. The most important word, safari. Safari, if you want to roll your R's. It means overnight trip. Swahili has many forms, like all languages, and it has changed over the decades. Oh, no, excuse me, over the thousands of years it's been around. My favorite app so far is uh, Google Translator, but my favorite references are my, my friends, my Rafikis, who chime in. Thank you, Johnny, for the Swahili word for fun. I can't even remember what it is right now. I just remember it was super, super long. I think I like the idea of the shortness of fun, F-U-N. And also, thank you to my cousin Karen, who goggled it for me. She let me know. All right, so here we go. We're going to start right on page uh, two of Jumbo Mama. I'll get you started. And today I will share with you chapter one. Nothing says travel like the word safari, unless you're a timid, prepubescent, blonde female straight out of Wisconsin. If you have parents at the helm who choose to teach by fire, you understand quickly that it will behoove you to pay close attention and take frequent notes. 
lest you become the kindling. My little brother and I, aged 10 and 13, had such an experience when our parents moved us to Nairobi, Kenya. These are my notes. What I wish I'd known. Number one, sink or swim. Two, play along. Three, accept all social invitations. Four, mind your manners. Five, learn the language. You know, that should have been one. I'm sorry about that. Number six, keep your hat on. Number seven, keep your head down. Number eight, carry on. Number nine, find charity. Number 10, take odd jobs. 11, respect royalty. 12, try new foods. 13, make wise choices. 14, take notes. 15, stay together. 16, find your mojo. Number 17, face your lions. 18, mind your own business. Number 19, carry a bottle. Number 20, maintain. 21, don't assume anything. Number 22, take the train. 23, don't be chicken. 24, write poetry. Number 25, wear sunscreen. 26, duck and cover. 27, pity the tourists. Number 28, love your mama. And number 29, start a band. Prepare to learn about yourself while on your safari. You'll come to appreciate your place in this world. You will learn that even the smallest footprint has a huge impact on the road. So I've dedicated this book to the combo women of Nairobi. From them, I learned even a small person can play a big drum. Safari Missouri, good trip. Chapter one, sink or swim. When my family first moved to Nairobi in 1967, the hippest Kenyan phrase in English was, wait, don't abuse me, which I eventually learned was meant literally, hey, don't misuse me. Every young African man of the 20th century, if he was wearing Western clothes, was wearing a 007 belt buckle. Mr. Connery had already graced our shores several years before that time, making the belt buckles seem almost old fashioned, even though they were so in fashion there. Only one color and design was available in the Nairobi market, black cheap leather with a rectangular silver colored buckle looking like an out of order torch with 007 stamped in the center. We spent three glorious months residing in the Grosvenor Hotel, a small one-story East African colonial hotel. We had two rooms, two loos, access to the swimming pool, free billiards, and an endless bar tab. There were no age limitations on anything then, not on beer or pambe, cigarettes or drugs. My little brother Adam and I immediately started making mental bucket lists. <gasps> Where to start? For me, it was chai the tea my mom liked, and for Adam, kahawa, coffee, like his dad. The message I took from sharing that formerly verboten world with my parents was that it was much more fun to play along with everyone, the adults too, drink a shandy in spite of the fact it was a mix of lemonade and beer, puff on dad's cigar, and start each day with a chai. It was the beginning of my long, torturous relationship with indulgence. I was 13, my brother was 10. We thought we were mature for our age. This was the era that Kenya first began wearing its Western shoes, adapting Misungu, white folks' ways and lifestyles. People that had worked the rails, so to speak, were now managing the train systems. African men did all of the hotel's restaurant jobs with the exception of the management positions, which were filled by Indian men. Mr. Patel, the hotel's manager, wore a handsome suit and had an impressively deep bow. Many of the restaurant positions also had African associates shadowing them, more trainees. African women worked in the laundry room and kitchen, so we didn't often see them about the hotel, but we knew they were there. We could hear their voices all day long, children too. Huh. Adam and I thought, kids around all day long? How come? African boys ran messages and errands. 
It was during the school day's hours, yet there these boys were working and most of them shoeless. We thought that was pretty strange too, but within a few days, we'd given up our shoes as well to the distress of our parents. Why do we have to go to school? Adam confronted mom. Those kids look all right to me. It took some doing to talk us down off the truancy wall, but they eventually did it by bribing us with promises of daily sweets at the school tuck shops. Ooh, cream puff Mondays, cooed my mother. Why do you smell the cream puffs? She began sniffing in great greedy gulps of phantom aroma. They baked them in the morning and you could smell them from all around the school. Be first in line. They run out every week. That did it. That got me back in the eighth grade. Not all men wore shoes. When they did, it was usually the rubber tire sort. But every man at the hotel wore a waiter's or a busboy's white jacket, regardless of its condition. Pants or shorts of every color, sort and state accompanied the ensembles. Fashion in Kenya could lean towards east-west on one person and west-east on the next, hemispherically speaking. Regardless, everyone from both sides of the bright meridian looked like they were making amateurish attempts at learning to wear hats for the first time. Had no one found their mojo? The difference there in Kenya was that everyone was very comfortable doing so. We Musungus dressed almost the same as the Kenyans, sans 007. People kept kowtowing to us. It made us all uncomfortable. So we responded with lower bows and bigger smiles nodding our heads. We were living in a world that still breathed the last gasps of British colonial treatment of its subjects. We'd have to get used to it, not the other way around. We would spend the next four years of our lives learning to navigate life in a world that would appear on the outside to be familiar, but in truth be totally strange. It felt as though our parents had thrown us into the ocean and said, swim! But we did it. We swam. We played along. We bowed and we waved. Adam and I both saw a huge difference in the behaviors of Americans at home versus those living in Kenya. Adults were much more open about their personal lifestyle choices on the equator. They didn't rein in much anything as far as kids, not all the adults, just the many presumptuous ones. It felt like my zone of tolerance was expected to open up just because the bar cabinet had. Mom and Dad's dinner date calendar picked up big time. Suddenly, the jokes and stories Dad brought home from social events were sexier, more complex, more political, and also more philosophical, deeper. They required more thought and input from me. And I thought, maybe I'm more grown up than I know, huh? Adam and I started calling our parents Mary and Mick. It made us feel more like Rafikis, friends. Kenyan American social life was a constant flow of new people filtering through the university and embassy communities. Relationships were formed and sometimes ended quickly. Work contracts were assigned in two and four year stints. The surroundings made them intense and more romantic. It all made up for a good recipe for short, passionate bonds. Adam and I would have loved to remain at the Grosvenor Hotel our entire lives, but Dad's employer, the United States Agency for International Development, moved us to the Hurlingham Apartments right around the corner from the hotel. Our three-room apartment was on the second floor, directly above the so-called untouchables, who lived outside in shacks and boxes right under our windows. I don't exactly know when I learned that term, untouchables. I thought it sounded pretty unfair. What did that mean? After a few incredulous questions to our parents, we learned that the Hindu caste system had basically outcast a big chunk of their own people, declaring them too foul even to be touched for the color of their skin. I looked down at the pile of boxes, rethinking every social studies book I had ever seen, and I thought, wait, what? Even at the mere age of 13, I was ready to embrace the idea of equity in all things, but I hadn't realized until then that it was all pretty much bullshit. 
if we haven't been able to qualify the basic human needs for all. And then, of course, because I was 13, I, I came to my senses and I turned it around to myself. I wouldn't repair my skin with land me if my Scottish roots are as rigid with her clans and covered with freckles and slippered. Okay, sorry about that. I know it sounds a little too Irish or British or something. It's supposed to be Scottish. I fretted to my parents. They rolled their eyes. Clear they had more explaining to do. Adam and I did not understand what we saw from the apartment window. Sitting there overlooking what we thought was a market, we first thought we'd scored a great flat with a view. Look, I pointed out to Adam, there's the Nairobi River. There was so much human and traffic congestion around it, we couldn't see it at first. Below us, a confusing stack of boxes, some wood, some cardboard. I thought it was a storage area for the mall we lived above. At 5 p.m., we savored the first whiffs of a wood fire, perhaps someone cooking food. Adam pointed out that the smoke was coming from one of the boxes. A minute later, another fire in another box a few feet away. A few more minutes and we were shutting the windows, despite the equator heat to fend off the smell of the fires competing with the foods and the stink of worn out cardboard. Our noses pressed to the glass, Adam and I began singing that funny Malvina Reynolds song, Little boxes made of tiki tacky and laughing, but still overlooking this scene. The truth had yet eluded us as it often did in East Africa. Suddenly my brother yelped and pulled sharply away from the window. Oh man, those are houses, shouted Adam. There's all sorts of people in there, Doc. He was still smiling because it was kind of cool to see how wonderfully creative people can be. Far out! But I, a 13-year-old blonde premenstrual Midwest chicken, was besieged with feelings of angst over everything I had met in my new world. This was too much. I was in tears. I stood at the window looking down at it and said the only thing I could. No! There was no turning back. The actuality had just hit. The pictures in the Nairobi National, no, in the National Geographic magazines that we'd studied did not prepare us for what we saw before us. Suddenly we faced the realization that not everybody on this earth is cared for. Realizing these funny tiki tacky boxes were houses, homes, and not some weird African living room fort, we froze. It hit us like a brick wall. Within only a few more minutes, the entire storage area came alive with a community, bursting like a human jiffy pot bag. Quickly, it was crammed with far too many people for one small space. Adam and I looked at each other, sharing a common thought. I think we just found the thing they didn't want us to know before we left. Learning the truth about the world made me feel betrayed by my parents, in a way. My life suddenly felt, seemed, like it had been at the expense of someone else. I couldn't get over the imbalance. Maybe our parents didn't prepare us because they wanted us to feel poverty's full impact. Hitting the wall had always been their preferred teaching approach. Suddenly, it felt as though the whole family had accidentally enrolled in the school of hard knocks. Everyone screamed at each other down there in the world of the boxes. The smell of the fires competing with the foods made me feel sick to my stomach. I scowled at my father. You might imagine this, realizing this was to be our new reality. Poverty is loud. It's angry. It's smelly and terrifying. To be a privileged child in this world of hunger was hard to face. It made me feel greedy and fat. When we were in town, we learned to duck our heads, avert our eyes, and keep moving. We gave away what coins we had, smiled, shrugged our shoulders apologetically, and walked away because we had to. Holy, holy, we said so many times, sorry, sorry, everywhere we went. To engage in any real way meant to be instantly surrounded by two dozen children screaming shrilly and jumping up and down. 
Every time I encountered a group of children like that, I wondered what would happen if I stopped to visit. Would I still have my shoes or would I have been talked out of them? The cardboard box houses were right under our room so that we could look out the windows down into their world and scream along with everybody, should we choose. I learned quickly that I should not stick my nose out during the especially loud exchanges, or ever. I did that once and unintentionally made eye contact with a woman who just stepped out of one of the boxes. The anger in her eyes told me so much that for the remainder of my stay there, I watched my back. Men and women screamed at their children and each other constantly. Some of the women's voices were so shrill they sounded like gulls being massacred. I thought I would go crazy or just die living there, but at least it was a home and I knew it. Maybe that's partly why I started screaming right along with the rest of the hood. I couldn't fathom the idea that boxes could be called a home by any standard any more than their occupants could imagine living as I did with water and food whenever and a bed, a bed. I take mine for granted, I know that now. In spite of the fact that there did not appear to be any permanency in these places, people kept returning and gathering, cooking and sleeping, drinking and fighting, and I forgot to say this the first time, and laughing and loving. The boxes dissolved overnight in the rains and were replaced by new ones. It was then, that Adam and I realized our home on little old Bordner Drive in Madison, Wisconsin, was the lap of luxury, and we, unbeknownst to us, had been living the big life all these years. It sure hadn't felt like that to us. We weren't off to Disneyland ever. Well, okay, I'm from Wisconsin, so that's not that unusual. But our folks didn't have big bucks for that kind of living. This was different, very different. This realization did not give either of us sympathy or understanding. It upset us, confused us, and it made clear how we wanted to experience life. It didn't enlighten us at that age to do anything other than escape it. It was frightening and heartbreaking at the same time. I'm glad we were so young, eager to jump into the mix in spite of our qualms. Okay, so I'm getting ready to start chapter two, but I'm just going to get you started with a little bit of it so I can use it to tell you about my next video cre creation, which I should be producing in one week. So here's the beginning of chapter two. It's called Play Along. Eventually, we moved into a big home after six months of hotel luxury and subsequent apartment residence. At night, Adam and I sat up at our windows, looking over our own backyards, observing the lives of Africans who seemed as if they were living with us, but in fact it was we living with them. Watching the lights from the fires below, dancing over the faces of the servants, listening to their voices, we heard our first Kikuyu language. We imagined what they were saying. Oh, what a busy day I had, etc., etc. Sounds from the local radio station carried up to our bedroom windows on the second floor, casting a Kenyan top 40 wave over all three of our homes, unifying us in melody and rhythm. We swayed and danced along from inside our home while Smart, Rosie, and Njorogi sang from below. The children were sent to bed before us, a point of great pride in our immature scope of what is important. I guess I understand why all children were considered to be secure being a home alone there because we weren't ever really alone. Even if, even if our parents were not at home, the servants were there. Babysitters by proximity, I guess. There, it was easier to leave the kids at home in the evening. The house help would have gone home to their little houses for the servants in the backyards. Adam and I were maturing quickly and old enough to be on our own, but Mary and Mick had forgotten to tell us about servants. They left this next business out of their Kenya sales pitch because they might not have known that all the homes for people of standing had servants' houses with them on the same grounds behind the main one. Cooking, housework, and gardening help was so affordably done by local Africans that to not utilize them 
would have been an inconsiderate waste of a home and a living for at least two African families. These houses were Spartan. Some had wood floors instead of dirt like the others. Families shared common cooking quarters in the evening after their employers dinner, and the backyards came alive as housemen and gardeners returned to their homes, their families, their dinners. But we had experienced so much restructuring in our family, veritably losing our two older brothers to the move, that the prospect of sharing our parents with complete strangers was not thrilling to either of us. We got over it in time once we discovered how nice it is not to have to do your own laundry or your meals or your housekeeping or your gardening, to have it all done for you. Every American house also had a guard, a guard patrolling the house at night. The American Embassy always said they assigned the scaries to protect the Ethan Allen furniture they supplied our homes with but we chose to believe they were there to watch over us. <laughs> Ascaris arrived promptly at 6 p.m. and stayed the whole night until daylight at 6 a.m. And that makes this a great place to stop today and tell you about my next publication, which I plan to share with you next Sunday. Get ready to hear the tales of the little Ascari. It is written by me, and it's illustrated by another former colleague, Mrs. Nan Jacobson. It is geared to a younger reader. So, before I go today, I need to give a shout out and a couple of reminders for you. Alrighty? I would like to say a big thank you to the other youngers in my life, specifically Kelly, Swag, and Andrea for giving me solid advice and navigational wisdom throughout this project. And I am most grateful to my family for caring and showing it to me. Love your mamas, will you? I am a member of the Gold Country Writers Guild in Auburn, California, and they have given me the desire to pursue my dreams. Seriously, if you are interested in writing, you look up the goal uh, a uh, writer's guild in your area and you will find more common thought and inspiration there than you could ever hope to imagine. They are the ones that sort of kicked me into action. I self-published this book uh, in the spring on Kindle self-publishing and then I used WeVideo to create my promotional material. I took a class at the local adult school. In my case, it's the Placer Adult School. I took a class to understand how to use a Wii video, video system. In fact, the drum music I used at the beginning of this um, project is coming from the Wii Video Stock Library. But let me tell you about the outgoing music. That is a song called Use Me, which comes off of an album called Tough Love which was recorded and released by my brother, Chris Mickey, on Amazon. You can find his music there. All right, guess what? Good news. You can follow me on Facebook and on Instagram, at Jumbo Mama. But please check out my YouTube channel, Mama Sarah's Story Time. Stay tuned for more exciting adventures to come. Remember, you don't have to be a child to enjoy their books. And for now, kwaheri ya koanana. Goodbye until I see you some more.